With so many burning issues in the world today, it's important that we're all as informed as we can be. Now, one man that's more informed than most is F. William Endall, geopolitical analyst and author of the book Myth, Lies and Oil Wars. And he joins me right now. Thanks very much for speaking to us. Thank you. Syria is, of course, the main issue at the moment globally. Just how close are we to seeing a foreign military intervention in that country? Well, the West, in particular Washington, has been trying for 17, now 18 months almost, to uh, blow Syria sky high and, and spread the chaos to Iran, because Iran is, is the real uh, target of the, of the whole Syrian destabilization. I think we're on the cusp of the potentiality for a World War III. You have the superpower involvement of the United States as the behind-the-scenes kind of puppet master of, of, of what's going on from the Erdogan government in Istanbul and Turkey. Erdogan is being heavily pressured by Hillary Clinton and the U.S. State Department to massively intervene in Syria. He's being heavily pressured inside his own cabinet to not intervene because 23% uh, of, of the Turkish population is Alawite uh, Muslim, the same as Assad, this minority in, in uh, Syria. And most Turks regard the Syrians as brothers. They're not, they are not, don't see them as enemies. The potential of Syria to blow up is far greater than anything that I've seen in, in more than 30 years of, of geopolitical analysis. This is really playing with a fire that, that could go wildly out of control. And some people obviously want that in the Middle East. But who benefits from Syria being out of control? I think the the operation would be rolled into a destabilization of Iran very rapidly. Not a military intervention. I think this is all smoke and mirrors on the part of Israel. So you're saying that Iran is the ultimate goal? For Washington and for, more particularly, for the very powerful interests in the Anglo-American oil multinationals who have used oil since World War II, not only to fuel industry, but as a lever of political control, geopolitical control, if you will. This is the theme of the book Myths, Lies, and Oil Wars that I just uh, released. And for them, chaos in the Middle East would open the door for huge new discoveries that they're sitting on top of in the Caribbean, in uh, Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, which they've not talked openly about, but uh, uh, competent geologists have, have told me that there are enormous resources there that are untapped. BP and, and the ExxonMobil and so are simply sitting on these until uh, the opportunity is right. But to do that, they'd have to have a far higher oil price. And of course, chaos in the Middle East serves that purpose. So I don't think it's as simple as that. I think there are a multiplicity of things going on. But as Henry Kissinger said in a recent interview, what is going on is not a fight for democracy and human rights inside Syria. It's a war of within religion, within Islam, between Sunni, but not only Sunni, the Wahhabite, Salafist branch of Sunni that dominates Saudi Arabia, uh, not the, the version of Sunni that, that uh, is endemic in Turkey since the time of Ataturk, which is a very secular non-state involved until the Erdogan government. So if you have a war Sunni versus Shia within Islam, you have the potential to blow up the rust and ur refineries in Saudi Arabia where all the workers, all the skilled workers in the refineries are Shia, Muslim, and not Sunni. Uh, only the Saudi royal family and, and a minority in, in Saudi Arabia, or not a minority, but uh, so they, they depend on outside labor. So you have the potential to blow up the, uh, the heart of, of the oil production of the world economy. What would that do to Europe, Western Europe? It would be devastated. I don't think that that would benefit the United States economy in any way, shape, or form. I think these are political interests who stand above government, above state, and use the instrumentalities of state, State Department, uh, Pentagon, and so forth, to pursue uh, their own private agenda. I think the scheme is utterly mad. I think the whole Bush plan from, from 2003 for the Greater Middle East Project, uh, which this is an extension of the whole Arab Spring, is an extension of that State Department uh, project. Uh, to break open these, these state regimes, these monarchies in the Middle East, open them to privatization of the oil and other things, and uh, literally create the kind of chaos that was created in many countries in Eastern Europe after 1990 with the uh, collapse of the Soviet system. So we're dealing with an instability that has the potential, I think, to get out of control of anyone. So are you saying that there's the shadowy figure of big business behind the crisis in Syria? not big business, I'm talking about big oil, but there are only four companies in the world who 
call the shots on this, and they're intimately interwoven, like the British East India Company in the 1700s, 1800s. They're intimately interwoven with the instrumentalities of state, whether it's the British government with the case of BP and Tony Blair, or it's the U.S. government in the case of Exxon Mobil, uh, Chevron, uh, Condoleezza Rice was a board member of Chevron before she became national security advisor to Bush and later secretary of state. And the interplay between U.S. intelligence services and big oil is almost seamless. Take the case of Dick, uh, Dick Cheney's uh, stint at Halliburton, the world's largest geophysical services company, oil services company. At the same time, they're the largest constructor of military bases and equipment around the world. So, I mean, I think that epitomizes it. Big oil and the military-industrial complex are seamlessly interwoven into a powerful lever uh, for certain interest groups, private, and I think to a less extent the interests of the American people. In fact, uh, quite against the interests of the American people. A lot's being said about Russian opposition to foreign military intervention, but China also opposes that. Why is China taking that side? I think for the Chinese, they recognize the, uh, the devastating f mistake that they made in, in letting the Libya intervention take place. I mean, this was, this was a destruction of, of the country that was at war with no one. But uh, they realize that if Syria falls, then you're going to have literally a series of dominoes this time, and the next to fall would, would likely be Iran. Iran plays a vital role in the Chinese energy national security. They already have lost South Sudan, or or uh, threatened with the loss of South Sudan. They've lost Libya, where the Chinese had an active oil involvement in some of the richest oil fields in Africa. And th they're fighting to keep their toehold in, in Africa. So uh, if, if Iran, then the Iranian supply of, of crude oil to the Chinese economy were then jeopardized by chaos inside Iran, China will be the ultimate loser. And I think they realize that. In fact, I know they do because I've spoken leading Chinese uh, strategists in, in Beijing late last year when my book uh, Miss Lies and Oil Wars was released in Chinese and uh, they, they do realize this this is this is ultimately directed against the, the rising economic uh, presence on the world stage of China. Well let's move focus away from Syria now and look at WikiLeaks and the case of Julian Assange. Now you have some theories on what's going on there don't you? Well, I, th I think the whole WikiLeaks, if we go back to the original story of this private uh, Barry Manning uh, or Brad, Bradley Manning, excuse me, uh, sitting there listening ostensibly to Lady Gaga uh, CDs on his MP3 in Baghdad and downloading, what is it, 100, 200,000 pages of classified State Department uh, cables from all over the world. I think the likelihood that that could go undetected for so many months is uh, less than zero. But once you have the cables released to WikiLeaks, What's uh, rather bizarre is that Julian Assange uh, gives those cables to the trust of The Guardian in London, the Der Spiegel in Germany, and to the New York Times to select what they think are the most important uh, leaks to, to publish in their newspapers. So as Brzezinski, who's uh, certainly one of the most uh, knowledgeable people on this because he's done this over the decades, is national security advisor, it's a big new Brzezinski, pointed out at the time in an interview, uh, this is a perfect opportunity for one or another intelligence service to, amid all of the actual cables that are released that are real cables, some of them mildly embarrassing to Washington, but very few of them that I've seen, uh, you can spike, you can put little pinpointed tidbits of disinformation in and claim that that's part of the cables. With Assange set to spend his foreseeable future inside the Ecuadorian embassy, where do you see things ending for him? I have no idea. Uh, the What's bizarre is the charges on which this extradition process is, is being uh, prosecuted in terms of the Swedish government for plausible rape of, of two women that, that he had relations with, or some kind of uh, relationships were told. What that did, I think, was to create a titillation in the media about this fellow Assange, such that he became an attraction, just like a certain group in, in Moscow that has created an incredible titillation in the world media since they had their trial recently. Now, you just alluded to the Pussy Riot trial in Russia there. Do you see that there was somebody manipulating them in their actions? 
I think there's no doubt uh, that it was managed by somebody, and I think the somebody uh, is the same somebody who has been trying through Navalny and various other so-called dissidents. Most of them have a record of involvement with agencies or NGOs connected with the U.S. State Department. Uh, in the case of Navalny, he openly has been documented taking money from the National Endowment for Democracy, a U.S. government-financed uh, NGO that conveniently appears in all the countries where there's a color re revolution in, in preparation by Washington. Uh, and I think uh, the so-called pussy right, first of all, it's not a punk band, it's not a musical group. Uh, it's a political provocation, provocation collective. What's clear to me is that uh, the, of course, when you name a group with an outlandish name like that, and then do the kinds of stunts, I, I won't mention them on the air, but what's been documented and in, in visible YouTubes that uh, one can find on the internet with little difficulty uh, are things of such obscenity and, and violation of the decency of, of womanhood and, and human decency that uh, it almost comes under the name Satanism. Uh, and they've done this repeatedly throughout uh, the past months and years before this desecration inside the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow. Now you mentioned Satanism there, but the women themselves said that this wasn't aimed at offending the church, that they were just making a political statement. And I think freedom of speech does not permit people to make up, well, they were making sexual gestures in, in tights and so forth and with masks on. And you can argue these are only old believers who were there and so forth. That's their right to worship in the way they want to, unhindered and uninterrupted. And that's a desecration. If, if that were done in a synagogue in New York City or Tel Aviv, I can assure you that the people who would do such a disruption would be spending a much longer term, or in the UK, I think in the UK the, the limit, uh, the maximum uh, in jail is 14 years, not seven as it is in Russia. Do you think that the media outrage over this was because it was happening in Russia? Yes, oh, no, no question in my mind. Why Russia? Well, I think the point is to put Russia on the defensive internationally, especially Putin, who is a hardball player and Washington was very uh, uh, displeased when Putin uh, came back as a, as a presidential candidate after after a hiatus uh, with Medvedev. Uh, I think the point is that uh, Putin defends Russian national interests in a very active way, in a very determined way, and that's something Washington doesn't want to have right now. They don't want to have strong leaders who draw lines in the sand in Syria and places like this. They want compliant people who will play ball the way they want to play ball with the crooked rules that uh, often they write. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good talking.